Now let's try to parallelize this application and let's do it with both shared memory and with message passing. We're going to do the parallelization in a similar manner, which means that if I have n processors available to me, then I'm going to break up the rows into different groups. So in this example, I have you know one group of rows that is allocated to processor 1, then the next set of rows are allocated to processor 2, and so on. Okay, so I'm essentially partitioning the rows among the different processors. So process 1 or processor 1 is responsible for updating all of these rows that are assigned to it. And similarly, process 2 is responsible for updating all the rows assigned to it. So for the most part, each process is going to work with somewhat private data, right? So a value over here is only ever going to be updated by process 1. And a value over here is only ever going to get updated or read by process 2. But all the elements on the boundary, you know, will have to be exchanged among neighboring processes, right? So an element over here needs to read a value from the previous row, which actually belongs to process 1. So every time process 1 produces a new value for this row over here, it has to pass those new values to its neighboring process as well. So there is data exchange between neighboring processes and you know these processes are essentially going to exchange the rows that form their very first and their very last rows. Okay, so let's first look at shared memory and let's see how I would transform that program into a shared memory program. So you first create some global memory and you, and you initialize your two-dimensional array in that global memory. Then you create nprocs different versions of procedure solve and you're passing the array to everybody. So procedure solve then takes over and every process is initiated with a process ID, right? So if I'm starting out nprocs different processes, each process is going to have a process ID that tells it I am thread number zero, I'm thread number one, two, three, and so on. So you use the process ID to figure out what is the first row assigned to me and what is the last row assigned to me. Once I've done that, I'm going to go through my while loop. And in this while loop, I have the two nested for loops that walk through my different rows, that do the averaging step, that compute how the new value is different from the old value. And you'll see that each thread now has its own myDiff variable that's keeping track of how my rows have changed from their old values. Once you have done that, you are going to update a global diff variable, which keeps track of how all the rows have differed from their old values. Okay, so every thread needs to update that value. You'll see that, you know, like I had explained with the bank balance example before, if you're updating a global value, you need to acquire a lock, read the old value, modify it, and then write it back. And once that is done, you're going to check to see if the diff is within the threshold. If it is, then you are done and then you exit. Okay, there was one other thing over here that I've not yet pointed out, which are these barrier statements. And there are multiple barrier statements over here. So what a barrier does is it says that, you know, once you get to that point, you're going to sit there and wait until all the processes have got to that point as well. Okay, so for example here, once you have done your work, you have to sit and wait until every process has finished its work and every process has updated the diff variable. Right? It's only after everyone has aggregated their diff values can you examine the diff to figure out if you're done or not. Right, So that's why there is a barrier over here that says you've done your work, now sit, sit back and wait, and when everyone finishes their work, then you can go ahead and examine the value and figure out if you're done. Now once you set done equals 1, you again have a barrier over here. And this is because if you didn't have this barrier, the threads would go right back to the stop and the first thing they do at the start here is to set diff back to zero. And so some thread that was slow and, and, and coming along may not have done this comparison just yet, right? So if diff has been set to zero, different threads are going to see different values of diff and they may disagree on whether they are done or not. Okay, so that's why you have to have a barrier here that ensures that every single process has looked at the diff value and everyone agrees on whether they are done or not once everyone has figured out if they are done or not, then you can proceed past the barrier and then go back to the start of the loop. Now there's yet another barrier over here and this is in place because once you get into this code over here, soon after you're going to update the diff variable over here. And it's possible that some thread, you know, maybe is stuck over here and has perhaps been context switched out. And so it does not get to execute for a long time. When it comes back, the first thing it does is it sets diff to zero, right? And so any changes that you may have made to diff get lost. Okay, so you have to make sure that everybody has initialized diff to zero. And once everyone has done that, then you proceed and start doing your work.
Okay, so you'll see that you know each one of these barrier statements is there for a very good reason. And while shared memory is supposed to be easy to program with, if I asked you to write this program, I'm sure many of you would miss one of these barrier statements the first time you wrote this code, right? So even if you're using shared memory, even though it's supposed to be easier to program with, it's very easy to introduce a bug, right? And that's in some sense the nature of any of any parallel programming model. Okay, so I hope you understood the basic primitives in a shared memory model where you have synchronization statements such as barriers and locks and unlocks and there is no explicit data exchange between threads, right? So as I'd mentioned that the rows are partitioned among the threads. So when thread one updates these values, the next time thread two wants to read this value, it automatically gets the new value, right? You don't have to explicitly send a value. The underlying hardware cache coherence protocol make sure that the values being read by the second thread are updated when, when they are modified. Now let's look at the message passing model. So again, it has a very similar early pattern. In this case, every thread is going to initialize its own set of rows, right? So you're doing a malloc and you're creating memory that only you can see. And so you initialize the rows that are assigned to you. Once you've done that, you again get into the while loop. You have a mydiff variable. And the first thing you need to do is, so let's again look at the rows partition among the threads, right? So let's look at what this, what this thread is going to do. It's going to take its top row and send it to the previous thread. It's going to take its bottom row and send it to the next thread. And similarly, it has to receive this top row from the neighboring thread and this bottom row from the previous thread, right? So you have to do two sends and then you have to do two receives. And that's what you're seeing over here. These are the two sends being sent to P process ID minus one and process ID plus one. What you're sending is your first row and your last row and then similarly, you're going to receive rows from your neighboring threads. Once you've done this data exchange, you now have enough information to update all of these values, right? You can iterate through all those rows and start updating those values. That's what you do here. And you compute a mydiff value. Once you've computed the mydiff value, you have to aggregate them all to produce a global diff value. And so you assign thread number zero to do this aggregation. So if you are not thread number zero, you're going to send your value of mydiff to thread number zero. This is what thread zero is doing. It's basically receiving all of those mydiff values from everybody else. It's aggregating it into its own diff variable. And once it has received the values from everyone and computed the diff value, it's going to check to see if the solution is converged or not. You're going to produce a value for done. And then you have to send that value of done to all of the other processes, right? And so all the other processes are for having sent the diff values are going to sit and wait to figure out if they have completed, if they have converged or not. And then if you've converged, then you exit. If not, you loop back and redo the while loop up here. Okay, so this is again, perhaps a little bit more intuitive and a little bit more easy to understand. And you'll see that there aren't too many synchronization primitives here. There are no locks, no barriers. And part of it is because the sends and receives act like barriers, they act like these synchronization points. And so even though the programmer has been burdened with explicitly exchanging data between threads, you don't have to worry as much about synchronization, at least in this example. Okay, so hopefully this gives you a sense for the different ways that you would write a parallel application. If you use message passing, then you are concerned with explicit data sends and receives, but there is almost no hardware support in terms of implementing cache coherence, and you can run your programs on any standard processor that is connected to other processors over a standard network. With a shared memory model, the programmer does not have to worry about explicit data exchange, but you do have to worry about race conditions and you do have to worry about synchronization, but you don't have to exchange values explicitly between threads. And this model does require support from the underlying hardware to make sure that once a value is produced, it gets sent correctly to whoever needs to see it. And similarly, when you do a load, there is underlying hardware support to make sure that you get your value from the right place. Okay, so this is a more hardware intensive approach. And this is kind of what we focused on for the most part in this class.